<laughs> Gotta press the button. All right. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, today, I would like to talk about Rust in the Linux kernel. <laughs> so, before we start, I'll, I'd like to talk, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, you know, what's going on here. You know, the Linux kernel is a very interesting project to put Rust in because, well, it's a code base that has a lot of special requirements on your code. Um, and you know, until last year, one of those requirements was that you had to use C. <laughs> but today, you can actually also use Rust. Um, so that's quite exciting. So let's talk about how's that going, what's the, yeah, what's going on? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Before I tell you what's actually happening, I'd like to tell you why is it a good idea. Um, so, why use Rust in the kernel? So, I very much see it from a perspective of security. Um, security vulnerabilities. Um, there's research that shows that any time you have a really large code base with millions of lines of code in a memory unsafe language, then you're going to have the majority of your vulnerabilities be memory unsafety. Um, and the blog post that this quote comes from is, uh, it has a list of, I think, seven different really large projects with millions of lines of C or C++. Um, and it goes through every single one of them and points out, yeah, it's true here, more than the majority is memory and safety for every single one. Yeah, and the kernel is also on that list. So, you know, the kernel, which is, you know, granted, it's one of the places where they, you know, put a lot of effort into writing correct code, but still, they're still on the list and they still have the majority of their vulnerabilities that are memory and safety. Now, I think you, most of you probably already know this, but there are some interesting additional statistics on this topic that I think are not as well known. Um, and one of those statistics is, you know, most vulnerabilities are actually in new code, it turns out. And this, is, uh, this graph is from the Android code base where you can look at all of the vulnerabilities that have been found in the you know, OS itself. And you will find that half of all vulnerabilities are found in code that's zero, zero years old. So, uh, so, and so, so what this really means is that if you're going to introduce Rust to a large C or C++ code base, you don't have to rewrite everything to get the advantage. I mean, you know, if you talk to people who, from you know, the Linux kernel or anybody else, they have an ex excellent point if you say, you can't rewrite everything. That's not going to happen. It's too much code. It's, got, it's not worth it. But because of this, it means that you don't have to rewrite everything. You will get a lot of the bang for the buck if you just pick the parts that are you know, new projects or being modified a lot and just focus your efforts there. Another thing is, you know, all of these projects, they, they're using a lot of different tools like sanitizers and so on to, to make sure that their C++ or C code actually is correct, but still, all of them still have a majority of their vulnerabilities be memory and safety. But in Android, they've been reducing the amount of um, memory and safety. And you can see, so the y-axis here, that's a percentage of the total uh, for both colors. And so we have the blue line here, which is 
how large of a percentage of new code is actually in a memory unsafe language. And you can see that's going down. Um, and then you can see how large of a percentage of your vulnerabilities are memory unsafety. And you, you can see that by reducing the amount, the percentage of new code that's memory unsafe, they've been able to push the fraction of vulnerabilities that are memory safety vulnerabilities below half. It's no longer the majority. So, so you know, correlation and causation and all that. But, you know, I still think that, you know, this is, like, if you, do, if you, you, if you want to say that it doesn't work, you have to explain this somehow. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so now you've seen these statistics that, you know, and I think th some of these statistics, like even though all of you know that it's a good idea to put Rust in the kernel, I think these statistics are probably new to many of you. And that's why I included them here. All right, so next I'm gonna introduce you to what's actually happening in the kernel. So there are a bunch of different projects going on. The first one is the Android binder driver. That's the project I work on, and you will hear more about that on the next slide. Uh, we also have some file systems. There's PuzzleFS and TileFS. These are related to something called containers, where you have some code outside of the container, and you want to expose it as a file system in inside the container. They allow you to do that. So that's a project to implement these read-only file systems in Rust. Then there's the Asahi Linux GPU driver, which is um, it's a project to basically make the GPUs on the new ARM Max work with Linux, um, with actual you know hardware acceleration. Oh, that's me. That's more. So and then there's uh, something in the block layer called the NVMe and the null block drivers, and these have to do with storage devices. Um, and so, you know, unlike the two other file system drivers, these have to do with how do you actual, actually talk to hardware. So it's kind of the other half of the file system layer. So that's also a product that exists. And finally, there's this ethics foo Ethernet driver, which is used to, it allows you to use a specific Ethernet chip with Rust. Um, yeah, and these are basically the projects that are going on right now. Anyways. Android. So I work on Android, and I'm working on rewriting a driver called Binder. So what is Binder? Binder is about communication between processors. You can see my nice graphic over here. You have two processors, and they can talk to each other. Yeah. Like, so yeah. Um, and you know, when you have to pick what is the first thing you're going to rewrite in Rust? So, so why did we pick Binder? That's this weird Android-specific driver. Most of you probably haven't heard of it. Um, so why Binder? It turns out that Binder is actually really important for Android. And you know, I don't know if you've thought about it, but you know, in some sense, Android is the most used Linux distro. Right, so it's it's kind of important that Android works well. And the thing about Binder is that it's really security critical. And you know, basically all communication between processors on Android goes over Binder. So it's really used a lot on Android. But why rewrite it? Well, it turns out that the Binder driver is really complex. Um, thousand line functions, hundreds of lines of cleanup you should go to, and so on. So it's an interesting um, code base. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, over time, it has accumulated a lot of tech debt. Um, and finally, you know, it has had security issues over the years. And so the problem with Binder is that because it's so complex, Whenever we try to, you know, refactor it to reduce the complexity, or reduce the tech debt, uh, 
well, we, we, we end up causing security issues. Like th there are examples of cases where we do a simple refactor and we introduce a security vulnerability. So reducing the tech deck is really difficult in Binder because it's so risky. So let's talk a bit about the, the security issues. So Binder has a really high security vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability density, it's called, which is the number of vulnerabilities per, num per thousand lines of code. In Binder, that's 3.1, and this is actually really high. It's one of the highest in Android. Um, and it's not getting better. It's, if you look at, like, if you make a graph of how many vulnerabilities have that happened by year, well, there have been three high severity vulnerabilities every year. We've already had three this year. So yeah. And another thing is, you know, when you have vulnerabilities, it's not always that they're actually exploited, right? If you have an vulnerability but nobody exploits it, well, it's not really a problem. But in Binder, there's a really high rate of how often we see a vulnerability having an associated exploit. We know of exploits for half of the discovered vulnerabilities. And the, the last thing is, you know, Binder is actually really security critical because stuff like the Chrome renderer, software codecs, all of these, you know, they're heavily sandboxed things, but you know, even sandbox stuff needs to talk to the outside world, which they do over Binder. So they have direct access to Binder, and if there's a problem there, well, that's a sandbox escape. So, Rust. In my job, I work on creating a Rust implementation of this driver from scratch. And it's actually going really well. We are at feature parity. We have, you know, Binder actually has a lot of features and we have all of them implemented. It passes all of the tests. Android has a quite large test suit. Um, you know, and we can even boot a device running Rust Binder and it works. You can Use apps and so on. We also have promising performance numbers. You know, there's still a lot of work to do because until now we've only done micro benchmarks and so on. But on those micro benchmarks, they have essentially the same performance. So, and I think that shows that Rust in the kernel can actually be used for things that's performance critical. And Binder is performance critical because let's say you have uh, some slow transactions happening during app startup. Well, that's going to be experienced by the user as jank. If you experience jank on your phone, it's probably Binder. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's actually pretty performance critical that Binder is fast. All right. So... Um, now I've told you a bit about Binder. Um, th now I will tell you, so how was it to write a Rust driver, right? What's that like? How is that different from Rust in user space? Because it's not entirely the same. There are di important differences. Um, and we will be seeing some code examples from the Android dri Binder driver to illustrate the differences. All right? Um, the first thing is, when you're writing code in the kernel, you have to call into C sometimes. Because you, know, you need to call all of those C APIs. And how do we do that? Well, we wrap them in a Rust wrapper. Um, and you know, if you're going to write a kernel driver in Rust today, I can guarantee you there's going to be some C API you need that nobody has written the wrapper for. So part of the experience of writing Linux kernel drivers 
at least today, but also I think for the foreseeable future, of course not always, but it's going to be that you have to write wrappers around C code. And, and this is, you know, this requires some understanding of unsafe. So this means that to write Rust in the kernel, you probably need to have a decent understanding of unsafe simply because you have to write all of these wrappers. So uh, in the kernel we have um, you know, some, let's say, like structure or a, a design, the way we like, create these wrappers to make sure that our code is maintainable and so on. And so what we do is that here on the right side, we take the include folder, which has all of the C header files that we want to call, we run it through bind gen, which generates a bunch of functions that are you know, just C functions we can call. They take a bunch of raw pointers and so on. But we don't want to call those directly. That's kind of not so nice. So we have this crate that has a lot of wrappers. The purpose of this crate is just to wrap every single C API in a safe interface. Um, and then in the driver, you just call into the safe interface. And so the driver does not need to use unsafe code. And that's the idea. So in some sense, the goal is to make sure that drivers need no unsafe code. But, and so we can isolate it into this kernel crate. And so we strongly suggest that, C, that Rust code does not directly call into the raw C functions. So one example is the work queue. You know, the work queue is a tool in the kernel that you can use to take some function and say, run this soon. And then the kernel will do that on the work queue. I had to write a wrapper around the C work queue API to make sure that we could use it from Rust, preferably idiomatic Rust. Uh, and this is an example of how it's used from Binder. We just implement this work queue work item trait. We implement a run function. We put the code that should happen when we run it. And, um, and then you can just schedule the thing. And the important thing is that in Binder, we, don't, we didn't need any unsafe to do this. Of course, you know, the work queue wrapper is unsafe, but not in binder. Yeah. So the driver here, we really want to avoid unsafe there. And we actually needed quite a lot of wrappers. <coughs> we have you know, a bunch of collections, mutex, spin logs. We need to directly mani manipulate memory, work queue. We also need to m work with files because you know, one of the things you can do with Binder is you can send a file, like an open file from one process to another, for example. So, and most of these did not exist when the Binder project started. So we had to write them. So what, how did that go? How much unsafe code do we have? Well, um, we have mostly safe code. So why is that unsafe at all? Well, it turns out that we did not actually rewrite the entire driver because Binder has something called BinderFS, which is a file system that you ba mainly use to initially get access to the driver. And we decided to keep this in C because one, it hasn't had the same history with vulnerabilities. For another, it's, it will require a lot of extra wrappers. So by keeping it in C, we avoid those wrappers. But this unsafe code, at least the majority of it, is used to call it to this C component, this C half of the driver. So th but this is also interesting because you know, it shows that you can actually have kernel drivers that are half Rust, half C. And what about the wrappers? Well, the yellow here is all of the wrappers. And of course, the wrappers also have a lot of unsafe. But 
One advantage of wrappers is that it doesn't scale with the number of drivers in the same way. Because if anybody else needs to use a work queue in a driver, well, they don't have to write that unsafe themselves. It's already done and hopefully correct. So, um, and if it's correct, then they can't mess it up from their driver. So this um, idea that you can take this unsafe code and the C code and encapsulate it in a safe API, yeah, that's, uh, that's really important to the kernel. All right, so we were talking about differences. Let's go to the next one. So in user space, when you need to allocate more memory, we just assume that this always works. There's no real way to handle uh, failures. And even if you try to handle failures, the kernel will just pretend that it succeeded and kill your program later when you actually use the memory. So in user space, it, this is not really something you can realistically do. But in the kernel, not only is it important, not only is it possible to handle all allocation failures, it's also necessary, right? Because what happens if you assume that it's infallible and it fails? Well, in user space Rust, we just call abort. But what happens if you call abort in the kernel? Well, now your computer has turned off. So, calling abort in the kernel is something we really want to avoid. <laughs> so, you know, and you know, th the standard library does have some functions to make this happen, so we can do that. But it ha actually has some interesting consequences on the way you write your code. Because, so the first one is that you actually end up with a lot more places where you have failures than you usually do in normal code because well, there are lots of failures due to allocations, right? You allocate quite a lot of memory in most code. And so, you know, let's say you insert something into a hash map, and then you allocate and it fails. You probably have to remove it from the hash map again, right? Um, and so you have to be careful that if you do anything that's not cleaned up automatically, and you have a failure, then you have to clean it up yourself. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, another interesting design pattern that comes up often in the kernel, but not outside of the kernel, is this thing where, let's say, let's say we have some object. A user space can ask us to create it, and later they can ask us to destroy it. Well, the destroy operation really should not be fallible. Right, because like, if you're running out of memory, you want to be able to destroy things to release the memory. So if it can fail, you have a problem. So let's say you need memory to destroy it. What do you do? So one uh, way to do that is to allocate the memory you need to destroy it when you create it and just hold on to it in the meantime. Here's an example from Binder. We have uh, this, this, um, this struct is used to keep track of the memory containing an incoming message. And we have this last field, which is just a red black tree node, which is, we are not using it. But we have to keep it around to destroy it, because when we destroy it, we have to store, store the new, like, store that this region is now free in a red black tree. So, yeah, this is a pattern that comes up in kernel development that I haven't seen that often in user space. Another thing is linked lists have an interesting advantage over vectors that, you know, normally linked lists are not great, but in the kernel, they have a unique advantage, which is that you can have you know, an allocation, and you can just keep it around. And then when you want to put it into a linked list, you don't need to allocate memory to do that. 
you just update some pointers next and previous, and so now it's in the list, no allocation needed. So this means that the kernel is going to use a lot more linked lists than you otherwise would do. All right. Another thing is, in the kernel, there are this thing called an atomic context, which basically means that you're not allowed to context twitch. You're not allowed to, like on the CPU, you have to keep running until you're done with the current thing, and you're not allowed to put some other thread in. And this means that you can't go to sleep. And so what sleeps, of course, you know, the sleep function will sleep, but another thing that sleeps is Blocking a mutex. This might block until the mutex becomes available. And the memory allocator has a mutex somewhere. So, yeah, allocating memory is not something you can always do. So, yeah. So, this actually gives an interesting consequence that you have no, now you have two types of mutexes. You have the mutex, which is the one you kn know from user space. You can lock it, and other threads will go to sleep until they can, un until you stop using it, the value. But there's also something called a spin lock, which is superficially similar. But when you can't acquire a mutex, you just go to sleep. When you can't acquire a spin lock, what happens is that you go around in a loop and you try again. Okay. Could you still acquire it? No. You go around in a loop and try again. And so the loop goes really, really quickly uh, until you can acquire it. And we re generally require that while you hold a spin lock, you need to release it again really, really quickly. So you're not allowed to sleep while you have a spin lock. One thing this means is that you can't allocate memory while you hold a spin lock. So you are forced to use this pattern a lot of times. So let me explain what's going on here. So let's say you have a mapping from some ID to some object. You want to get the value at a given ID, but if it's missing, you want to create a new one. And let's say that usually it's already there, so the missing case is rare. So what you do is that you take the lock, that's the orange ones, and then you check the collection, is it already there? And if it is, we're happy, we're done. That's the top line. But it might be missing. And then you have to give up the spin lock so that somebody else can go and access the collection while we create the new value. And so once we've given it up, we start creating the new value. This should probably involve some sort of allocations. And then you lock it again. And now you can insert it. But you have to be careful because you gave up the spin lock, which means that somebody else could have accessed it in the meantime and inserted the value. So if that happens, you have to you know, throw, a value, throw away the value you just created and use the old one. And so this kind of pattern, well, I won't say it never comes up in user space, but you know, it comes up a lot more often in the kernel, at least in my experience. I had to implement this several times in Binder. Yeah, and so so you know, spin locks just mean you have to do these kinds of you know dance to make sure that you do things correctly and handle all of the cases. I have some code here. So this is from Binder. This is just the exact same example again. Here, we have uh, a mapping from thread ID to some thread object. And whenever you call into the kernel, we check that, do we already know about this thread? If not, we create it. And so first, here in the yellow region, we check. Is the thread already there? If so, we're happy. If it's missing, then we go and allocate a new thread, which requires allocating memory. And once we've done that, we take the log again, and we insert it, and we return it. But somebody else might have inserted it already, 
And so we have to handle that case too. Now it turns out that this thing where you can't actually you know, go to sleep, this is actually, um, this is actually a safety requirement. There are some cases where going to sleep in an atomic context leads to a use after free. And taking care of that with the type system is not so easy. So what we do is that we, we actually wrote our own linter, similar to how Clippy works, which will check the code for this error and catch it. And so one of the safety requirements that we check in the kernel is checked with a custom linter. I think that's kind of interesting. All right, pinning. The pinning you are all familiar with, um, well, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but I'm sure you know, I've heard of it, is um, it's not strong enough for the kernel, it turns out. So to explain the issue, let me ex tell you what, what's, um, you know, in, use, in normally, when you create a value and you want it to be pinned, it has some time between the creation and the first use where it's not pinned. So usually, you create the value, you move it around to, so it's in the right place, and then you pin it. And you know, you pin it on first use. But in the kernel, you know, we lose, use a lot of C types that assume that they're pinned. And specifically, they assume that they're pinned from the beginning, rather than you know, on first use. And we don't want to check, is this the first use every time we use it? So what we do is that we have a special macro for initialization of pinned values, which is this one. And the macro introduces custom syntax, these arrows, which is supposed to mean in place initialization, which can create a value where the constructor knows what will the address be, and then it will be pinned from the beginning. And we use this in the kernel to initialize our pins values instead of what you normally do. Now, once you've initialized it, then pinning is enough. So anything that happens after the creation of the value, then we use the same mechanisms in user space. All right. Um, another thing is we need some unstable features. And you know, this, is not, this is actually kind of a problem for the kernel, right? Because we want to be able to say in the kernel, yeah, you just need at least this compiler. Anything above that will work for you, right? Because then they can just pick whatever they get in their distro, if it's new enough, and then we're happy. But because we need unstable features, we have to pin the compiler to a single specific version. And th yeah, this is something we actually need to move away from in the kernel at some point. So why is that? The biggest reason is that you can't implement Arc in safe Rust. You can almost do it, but there, there are some features that are missing. So one of them is din trade. If you want to have if you have a arc some struct and you want to, to convert that into an arc din trait, well, the, no, the standard library arc can do it, but you cannot write your own arc that can do this. And there's also some stuff with self parameters. And this is a problem for the kernel because in user space, when the ref count on an arc reaches maxim the maximum integer, then we just call a bot. But we talked about this before, you can't call a bot in the kernel. So we use the kernel's reference counting logic instead, which just, so, so when we reach the maximum, we just, we call it saturate, which means that we just leak the memory. The counter just never goes down. It just stays fixed at the same number. And leaking the memory is considered much better than killing the entire system. <laughs> 
There are also some other minor differences. We don't want the weak references in the kernel. They cause some problems for some cases. And another thing is that arcs are pinned. So the kernel's arc type will implicitly pin the value always. But these are more minor. It's really the first one that's the most important one. Yeah, we also have some other things. So fallible allocations. Um, here we actually not just need an unstable feature. We actually have a fork of the alloc crate in the standard library because we have some try functions that are missing. And so we have to both enable unstable features and fork the standard library to make sure that we have all of the fallible allocation methods we need. There are also a bunch of stuff related to constant evaluation. Because you know, in the kernel, we have to define these global variables that have these special meanings in the kernel. And there's also this offset off macro. I think that one is gonna be stable pretty soon, so hopefully that we'll be happy there. But you know, the custom arc one, I think it'll take some time before that one is, uh, is ready. And this is actually a point I want to make, which is that yeah, this is a problem for the kernel, but it's actually, these kind of things comes up in all embedded code. It's not just the kernel, it's also microcontrollers. So, if, uh, if, if you want to help Linux and the kernel succeed, you know, you know, of course, you can come and join us and write a driver, but another thing you can do is that you can work on these unstable features and get them stabilized. I really want to see Rust on embedded systems on stable Rust. That would make me really happy to see that. So yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>
a bunch of functions, especially the ones that call into C, so that Kalen can understand how they behave. So I don't think we have considered doing that, but um, maybe in the future. Cool. Thanks. Uh, I was interested in the in place allo uh, in place allocation uh, macro and framework in infrastructure. Uh, is that something that is uh, in the Rust for kernel tree? Is that something that is gonna be uh, uh, put in the standard library? Because I know that was uh, discussed for a long time now. So for now, it's just in the kernel tree. Okay. It's just a macro. Really curious about that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, hello. So I'm just interested. Uh, what's the procedure in Google when uh, a vulnerability is discovered? And like, uh, so are you going in a full panic mode, or what's the procedure? <laughs> The procedure in Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've never actually had to handle a vulnerability, so I don't know that much about okay, that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Who else? It's a big room. Thank you. You're getting lots of questions about that linter. Uh, mine was actually. Uh, okay, you said you have to annotate things because you need to know what needs this thing, wouldn't it be doable with a marker trait? Why l a linter and not a marker trait, like, you know, sand sync or those things, so that you just know that something needs to have a property and the compiler checks it? So, so there are a few different approaches to get the type system to, to check these, but they're really cumbersome. Bec they, because you can't just do it with sy send and sync, right? Because let's say that you have a function call here and another function called here, that, and then between those functions, you're in an atomic context. The type system is not going to catch that you do something between two function calls. That's not just not something the type system can do. And so actually catching with the type system involves something called token types, and that gets kind of complicated and annoying. Totally get it, thanks. Uh, a small question, this is very really something like a, a small nitpick. You showed, you showed uh, a piece of code when you had to take a spin lock, uh, leave it, and then take it again. Um, perfect. And it's just about coding style, just to know why you did it like that. So it's in a block. Would yeah. a drop without the block work exactly in the same way? Yes. OK, so it's just coding style. You prefer yeah, that's the block. no difference. Perfect. <laughs> Is there a reason for the coding style? <laughs> because I found In async, you have to do it like this. So that's what I'm used to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but uh, here it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so you make a good point. So another way to do this is to always make the allocation every time you call this function. Right? Because then then you just have the this button path. But the reason we don't do this is that the vast majority of the time, we already, like, it's already there. S and so, because of that, we only want to do it when it, we really need to. Would it make sense to have kind of um, thread locals to keep memory on hand instead of keeping it with every allocation that need, might need uh, additional memory to destruct? because then you would only have to have one memory area pre-allocated instead of having one for every value that you need to destroy. So, so the problem is that we have to be sure that it's really there. Like, if you do that kind of thing, like, you know, the memory allocator does that kind of stuff, but the problem is it could run out. And there's no way in the type system to make sure it doesn't run out when, before you need it. And so to make sure that we absolutely 100% don't run out, when we need it. That's why we have to do it this way. <laughs>
So you said uh, that the arc allocation has a special code when there's going to be an overflow that so that it saturates instead of overflowing. And uh, I was wondering um, if you have like um, what the bit count of the uh, arcs count is because uh, if you have like 32 bits uh, you can easily overflow that but like uh, with 64 it's probably pretty hard to to get there so i think the place where it happens is i size max so yeah you're probably not going to have that happen on a 64 bit system but it could happen on a 32 bit system and you know it's just you know, I'm pretty sure that ARC even has functions to increment the ref count by more than one in some cases, right? It's, um, it's pretty rare, and it's not something that's going to happen. Like, you can't do this unless you actually forget to run the destructors of an ARC, right? Because no matter what you do, like, unless you're forgetting the destructor of something, well, you're going to have a pointer to the thing for every count. And that's a lot of pointers. It's not going to fit. But if you forget to run the destructors, it could happen. So it's really only if you have a bug that this happens. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool that you can uh, do this saturation in an atomic uh, context. Thanks. Anybody else? Oh. Uh, how long uh, do you think it's gonna take to finish the rewrite and actually ship it on our phones? I can't talk about this. You had that slide about um, the bindings for the unsafe code, and it showed about half of the code was actually in bindings. Does that mean that we need to treat, uh, yeah, these abstractions? Are these abstractions actually unsafe, or is it okay? They they use the unsafe code directly. Is this the whole wrapper? Yeah, so this is the entire kernel crate, the yellow thing. It's the entire wrapper. And of course, you know, most of the wrapper is unsafe. I won't say 100% of the wrapper is, hmm. but you know, most of what it does is calling into C code, which is unsafe. Yeah, so, um, but why isn't it then in the unsafe Rust part here of the pie? So, so part of the point is that you know, as this project grows, we're gonna have a lot of drivers compared to the number of abstractions. Like this thing where you have to write an abstraction per driver, that's, that's how it is today, hmm. but it's a temporary state. And so the point is we, want, we do not want the number of unsafe code lines to grow with the number of drivers. And so we, we make an, a distinction between unsafe code in drivers and those in the <coughs> you know, wrappers in some sense, the unsafe code in the drivers is you know, worse because, well, it's, ha it, you know, it's hard to scale when it's in every driver. So what I wonder is uh, what these abstractions need to do to um, project a safe interface over unsafe code. So this really varies a lot. Some of these abstractions, like, um, like manipulating the open files, they're pretty simple. The work queue is pretty complex. The work queue does a lot of weird stuff. But the red black tree, for example, it's not so complex. It's a pretty normal C wrapper. So it really depends on how complex is the Rust interface we want to make. Um, how close are we to having being able to implement things like red black tree in Rust? Because that actually seems like a place where a lot of code could be safer and better tested. So you mean instead of having a C implementation we call into, which like we do here? What, I, 
have a, a, a Rust implementation that all the C code calls into. Yeah. Um, so, so one challenge with that is that, you know, Rust doesn't work on all architectures that the kernel support because we don't have G GCC yet. So doing this kind of thing where you replace core infrastructure of the kernel is blocked on GCC among other things. You know, of course, work is happening on the GCC front, but it's not there yet. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid uh, our time is over. So thanks, thank you, thank you, Alice Real for this interesting talk. Okay. <laughs>